And you've also probably heard about the Pioneer Programme, which is inside this wider programme. Uh, that's actually going through the process of, of selection now, uh, and the aim is basically to announce Pioneers uh, later in, in August. They will obviously help to test the way, but they're not the only part of this programme. The key issue is all areas must now make progress. And you might be conscious of the fact that the government recently announced the Integration Transformation Fund, which is trying to basically then use NHS and social care resources into a, into a single pool budget, £3.8 billion worth, which will have a key role in helping to facilitate and fund changes in the way in which that services are commissioned and delivered right across, right across the country. Um, there's a lot of detail inside the programme. What I've tried to do here is just to capture for you, in, in essence, um, what are the kind of main strands inside that programme. I've already talked about the narrative very briefly. I'll come back onto that and later on that uh, uh, very shortly. But in essence, these are the sort of ways in which we've clustered the various word streams to tackle some of the barriers, but also to put in place some of the enablers that local, local localities have been telling us over recent years they need help with. So things like leadership, workforce planning, um, cultural change, and building an evidence base. Uh, the evidence base out there in terms of, well, does integrated care and support actually deliver the improvements in, in service user outcomes that we're looking for? Does it deliver more efficient, more efficient services? Actually, the jury is out on that. Um, so we need to build a better evidence base. Then localities can look at that evidence and build their own uh, business cases and their own plans on the basis of, of the, the lessons learned there. I've already mentioned other barriers, for example, pricing incentives, and that's a key part of the programme, the extent to which there will be greater flexibilities, and to encourage and to make it better understood uh, out there in the system, um, the flexibilities that, that already exist. I've mentioned information, that's a key barrier, it's also a key enabler. If we can actually start to get um, data shared on a, on, a, on a more consistent and obviously clearly uh, on, on the same basis, we can actually start to let the information flow the same way as you would see a service user move between the, the barriers between health and social care. Measurement is a key part of the programme because at the end of the day we also need to make sure that we're actually measuring the impact we're actually having on, uh, on service users and the, the service user experience will be key in all of that. The Pioneer programme, which you see on the right hand side, um, as I say, that's, that's really intended to uh, identify perhaps 10 to 15, we haven't yet decided, um, exemplars around the country that could be at the leading edge, can demonstrate how to tackle particular barriers. We would support them in doing that, and then to draw lessons out from those pioneers and to share them through this thing called to the bottom of this, this eye case, this integrated care support exchange. Um, that exchange will be two way. It won't just be pioneers putting information into the exchange. We also want all localities to start to expand and take their efforts forward and to engage with them and to draw their lessons in so everybody learns from, from everybody else. Now, I, I mentioned really that kind of micro, the macro context because that's really important to understand how those national partners fit together. But the, at the center of all this is, is the individual. And this is just a quote which actually appears in the Our Shared Commitment document, and it's from on the basis of what the National Voices did for us in developing this narrative. And really, I think it encapsulates the, the, the frustrations and the, the, the poor experience that too often service users have experienced over, over recent years. And if you like, this should be the starting point for us to consider how we can take forward improvements. Now, there have been attempts to uh, to tackle integrated, um, the problem about lack of integrated care support uh, over many years. One of the issues has been, well, what, what do we mean by integration? Um, lots of people think it's about, you know, structural integ integration, horizontal or vertical integration. Um, at the last count, I think there were something like 175 different, different definitions of this. So the National Partnership commissioned National Voices to work uh, across the system with a range of stakeholders, uh, engaging very widely to try to identify what are the key principles that we're looking for in terms of person-centred coordinated care and to get those down on paper and basically to get the whole of the system aligned behind that and to adopt this particular narrative. 
Can I just have a show of hands? When I talk about the narrative, do people know what I'm talking about? Do, have people, are people, can they just show of hands if you know what the narrative is and you've actually seen the National Voices document? Okay, I'll say that's, that's probably about 35%. So I, I, I just did that test really because I'm going to talk a little bit about how do we take that narrative forward because having published it, that's not the end of the game. That's really just the beginning. The key issue here is that the service user needs to be the, the organising principle around which services are designed and delivered. It's not a question of the, if you like, the various suppliers and, and, and the providers on the supply side deciding what they need to do on the basis of their own views, but it must be on the basis of what the individual needs. And that individ those individuals will obviously need different things uh, across the country, so one size doesn't fit all. This is the headline narrative, the headline definition from that particular narrative. And if you like, it's the focal point, really, for what we're wanting to promote through the work that we're doing as part of this program. So we have this agreed understanding of what, if you like, what good looks like. Um, and it describes an individual's experience uh, through a series of, of I statements. Um, we were very keen to make sure they aligned with TMAP's Making It Real initiative. And indeed, TMAP continued to work with us on the narrative cluster as we take this work forward. Because obviously what we don't want to do is, in particular localities, have one set of I statements from, from making it real, another set of I statements on the narrative, and it will just be completely confusing. Which one do you use? Are they contradictory? How do we bring those together and really make sense of all of that? So the challenge now is having, having published this narrative in May, we need to adopt it. Now all the national partners that I mentioned who signed up to the shared commitment have adopted it. So at the national level, we're adopting this narrative in everything that we do. Um, but the key test now, the key challenge is, well, how do we test that? How do we support its adoption? Just publishing it really isn't, isn't enough. So we're wanting to encourage localities to adopt the three-stage process in line with making it real and start to test that out. How, how can it actually be applied in practice? And then we can draw those lessons out through the national exchange and make that available across all localities. Now Sam mentioned, I think very briefly, that we'd be looking for most or some of the pioneers to adopt the narrative. It's stronger than that. All pioneer, any pioneer that we will actually select to go onto the programme has to use the narrative. That's what it's for. We need that commonality of understanding. Now, of course, you can apply it in different ways, and you can take different parts of the narrative as you see them, as you see fit. But the whole point of the narrative is to get that national consensus and a view around exactly what good looks like, and that will obviously help in due course in terms of in terms of measurement. We're taking the narrative forward. Uh, we've got National Voices. Don Reddy, who's the policy director of National Voices. We've also got TMAP representation uh, and others across across the system, um, helping us take the narrative forward. So. We're now working on the development of sibling narratives around end of life care, frail elderly and children with complex needs, adults with continuing mental health needs, in order to push out the narrative because at the moment it's quite high level and quite generic. So it needs to go further, both in terms of its development and also in terms of, of its adoption. But the key thing we're also conscious of is that it's fine thinking about that in terms of on the commissioning or the provider side of, 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 of services. But there's also a real potential here for individual empowerment. The extent to which, if the narrative is a definition of what good looks like, and you're a service user, how can we enable and empower service users to use that narrative to help them ask for what they, they, they feel is, is appropriate for their particular needs? And if needs be, to, ch to challenge the system if the system in any way falls short of what good looks like. So there's a really strong element here of trying to think through how would we empower local service users to use that narrative in an effective way so that you both get the push and the pull about helping to improve the integration of care and support. And that's one particular issue that I'd really welcome your, your views on. How, how would we go about doing this? It's, it's early days, but would be, I'd be really interested to find out what your views would be. So I'm going to be quite brief in this, I'm just going to provide a bit of a bridge between the national context that the key has helped me set out um, and uh, how this is kind of landing locally. Um, delighted we've got uh, Martin Farron, the Director of 
Jonathan Barnsley, uh, co-chair of the Personalization Network and TLAP member to talk us through a bit of that. Um, I just wanted to say a little bit about why TLAP are sort of involved in this, because it might not be sort of immediately obvious um, to people. Um, integration may not be the only game in town, but it's certainly one of the biggest. Um, there really is a kind of rocket behind this now um, for all sorts of reasons, um, most of them uh, positive. Um, and I think it, it's, it, it's been opportunistic, um, but it's been the right thing to do um, for TLAP to get uh, involved in um, the work that um, Keith is leading on behalf of NHS England and that the National Collaborative is taking forward um, to make a reality of an integration over the next period. So I wanted to say just a little bit about what we've done um, and plan to do next, um, and then to make some of the connections that I think is critical that we do make and that Keith has mentioned between this very important agenda um, that is moving out of the, of the station at some pace um, and the agendas that we uh, in TLAP are fundamental to what we believe uh, a reformed care and support system needs to look like um, around personalisation and community based support. Um, so in terms of why we're doing this, um, I think it, it's, it's put quite simply, uh, integration is, is, is not a, uh, an end in itself, it is a means. It's a mechanism towards improving um, the way that our health and care system um, works. And there are some things about the shared commitment um, that are different, that give me some, some real confidence that this will be something that really makes a difference um, out there uh, on the ground for people with, with, with health and care needs. The things that I think are different you know, about this are um, what Keith has mentioned, that, that there's been a real effort made to ground this work in what is important to individuals and the narrative and that TLAP's had a big role in alongside National Voices um, is, is, a, is, is, a, is a really important part of that. It's very easy in talking about integration to get lost in um, system speak and to talk about how we need to uh, kind of bring processes together and integrate our workforces and, and uh, look at budget alignment and all of this stuff is important. It's complex and it will take an awful lot of getting right. But the bit that's really important, uh, the bit that TLAP's interested in, is making sure that while we do that, we keep a really strong focus on what is important to the individual, um, to the person with health or care need. And the narrative is a really strong thing, I think, that's different about this initiative. Um, we have made that, that, uh, that commitment um, with the narrative at its heart, saying this is what people with health and care needs would be saying if this were working well. And if we can get the areas out there that are pioneers everywhere else, focused on that in all of their endeavours with contracting and, and budgets and, and, and systems and workforces, that will be making a really significant um, difference, um, I hope. So I've just made the, the connections here that I think we need to make strongly and consistently over the next five years of this programme. Um, to say that there are reasons for, for TLAP to, to be involved um, and interested in this, which are that if this is a mechanism, a mechanism towards what end. And to my mind, it's a mechanism towards delivering across the health and care system the sorts of transformations that TLAP exists to drive forward. Um, and they are to make sure uh, that personalization is a reality in the lives of people with health and care needs, um, that prevention is, is kind of central um, to the way that our health and care system works, that we keep that broader focus um, on health and well-being, and that everything we do in this new endeavor uh, is grounded in that central kind of um, plank of co-production that runs through everything that TLAP does. Um, this has to be about people with health and care needs working with the commissioners, the providers, um, and uh, central and local government to get this right. Um, and I think there's a, there's a, there's a renewed commitment uh, uh, and something different about the shared commitment um, that makes that, I think, more of a possibility than it has perhaps been in the past. So we welcome this. Um, we've signed up to it. Um, we're thinking long and hard now about what on earth that means and how we um, make uh, a good fist of our contribution um, to that shared commitment. Um, so we've, we've been doing some thinking um, about that. Um, so I'm going to say just a couple of words about what we've done so far and what we plan to do next. Some of it uh, kind of duplicates what Keith's already run through, so I won't spend too much time on it. <laughs> It was wonderful, we thought, um, to find out that uh, the narrative was going to be central um, to the collaborative's plans around uh, integration. Um, we were uh, a little, uh, I, I guess, anxious, however, to make sure that that didn't end up being confusing for people. Uh, making it real uh, has been around some 18 months now. We've got, as I said, more than 600 organisations signed up, including more than half of the local authorities um, in the country to that. 
Um, and I think it, it reflects well on making it real and the process around that, um, that this initiative um, was taking a similar approach to uh, let's get a, a narrative which is a set of I statements of what's important to people if we get this right and make that central um, to everything that we do. We therefore worked very closely um, with Keith and colleagues at NHS England and with National Voices to ensure that that narrative which is now out there and which will be central to this work as Keith has described in the, in the next kind of five years is really well aligned um, with uh, making it real. So more than 50% of the I statements um, that are in the narrative are exactly those um, that appear um, in making it real. Um, when looking at the narrative on NHS England's site or, or anywhere else you come across it, there are also links directly through um, to making it real so that people can use that process, sign up and make that, um, that commitment. One of the very positive things, things we've seen as a result of that already um, is that amongst those 600 odd organisations we now have uh, a good smattering uh, of, of, of health organisations, clinical commissioning groups that have made um, that sign up. Um, I believe probably uh, in this session we have um, someone from Solid Hole um, where they've made a, a kind of a whole collaborative um, sign up to make it real, including the local authority, the CCG, um, the voluntary community sector, um, etc. And we're hugely supportive of, of, of that kind of um, endeavour. So it's a real opportunity, I think, to get uh, the principles behind making it real, and the, the principles behind what, what makes TLAP tick uh, central to this huge um, uh, kind of endeavour that's just kicking off. We've had some very practical involvement in the selection process around the pioneers. I think there were 100 odd bids that were received. They were brought down to a short list of 28. Um, and we've been involved, uh, the uh, National Co Production Advisory Group and Miro um, uh, and Clinton and others have been involved in looking at all of those bids, scrutinising them uh, on the basis of what potential is there within this bid um, around co production, around uh, uh, building community capacity, around health and well-being, around using personal budgets to integrate at the level of the individual. Um, we've provided um, some detailed comments back into that process, which we hope will uh, inform the selection process um, of the pioneers when that comes um, to be um, announced. We are working closely and uh, moving forward alongside National Voices on what uh, Keith called the sibling narratives. Um, that's the first time I've heard the word sibling narratives, I'm not sure I think of it. Um, we'll, we'll have to ask you, actually, that, that, would be, that would be a very helpful um, um, steer, I'm sure. We have plans already to create Making It Real um, for mental health, as we have done for uh, dementia, as we have done for carers. There is absolutely no point in doing that um, alongside uh, a sibling narrative for mental health. Therefore, we are working together um, to make sure that there is one document that comes out that says that if this is the narrative for what we want to achieve in delivering person-centred, coordinated care for people with mental health difficulties, then here's what it looks like. Um, so we'll be doing that jointly to make sure that this uh, all makes sense and that the agendas that you're working uh, locally to knit together, we do everything we can uh, nationally um, to help you in that. And we're thinking through very carefully um, the support that we may offer into the Pioneer programme and to other localities. Uh, in looking at those bids, it won't surprise you that we've been uh, keeping a, a bit of a mental list of where are the areas that we think want to do this using um, the kind of principles that ground uh, kind of TDAP. Where are the areas that where there's really strong evidence of co-production, where they've said they want to do this through personal budgets, uh, at least as part of their plans, so that we can design and flex our work program to provide support into that. Um, and finally, just to draw attention to the front piece of, of the narrative, which Keith has already done, um, do have a look at it, um, if you haven't already. Uh, I was quite impressed by the mental kind of uh, sum that was done there of 35% of the raising of hands. That was very accurate. I, I thought it was 37. <laughs> um, but it's, it's not enough, uh, is, is, is I think the point. So please do look at it um, when you're back uh, in the office um, and give us any kind of, uh, pointers that you, you, you like about how we move forward with that. I'm going to hand over um, now, but uh, let's Martin up here. I put up here, I was reflecting myself a little bit in terms of the journey when you're asked to do a presentation. I actually have also been asked to do something for the National ADAS Conference, which is coming up in. Um, well, the ADAS and Social Care Conference in, in um, October, and we'll write a piece on that. And uh, it made me think a bit about uh, a colleague of mine some years ago who uh, spoke to me uh, confidentially, suggesting that there was a new evangelism in town called personalization. Little did he know that I was an evangelist by heart. So uh, I, I think that it's worth thinking about that. And the reason I put it up is this is a heart and minds issue. 
it's not something whereby if you want to get scientific detail, you're always going to get the answers, because when you try something new, it's not always that feasible. And actually, the other thing that I would state, uh, it's also about cultural change. And we all like to think that we all want to change. And in my experience, we all want somebody else to do the change and we'll stay the same. So I think you know, we need to think about that and how we support people to change. I think in terms of integration, I'm going to talk a little bit more on, on how we've made it real rather than uh, integration as such, because I see that as an end product uh, in terms of how, how we actually deliver on some of this. So let's see, let's see if we can move on. Um, in terms of what we've been doing, and I'm obviously going to use Barnsley as the context for some of this, um, I think this is the bit where if we want to concentrate most, have the biggest impact, it is really about the engagement process that we have and about information and advice. I think that when we had putting people first, it was in the right direction, but whether we went far enough in local authorities to get really truly joined up. Uh, we often talk about the front door, uh, one front door. My experience is it's a proverbial high street of front doors for the service user because each agency has its front door. What we've tried to do in Barnsley is develop one front door with one web portal for health and social care across all of the agencies. I'm really proud of this. Uh, I think that the people who've developed it, including the service users who've advised about the information that they want, is really good. We've even uh, linked in initiatives such as how to connect us, uh, to other systems around providers, how providers can put forward information about what they can deliver. And so we have an online marketplace, and um, as it says on here, it's just gone live, so uh, we will wait to see at what level of impact that can have, but I'm really optimistic about it. The next slide, I think, is almost stating the obvious, but I do think at times we make things overly complicated, and I, I am a great believer in keeping it simple, largely because as a director, I, I wouldn't understand what was going on. So I think it is about recognising you've got to do all of these steps, because some people want to take control, and I think that's a real challenge to the statutory sector, recognising that you've got to be prepared to let people have control. But equally, uh, you've got to... Um, allows that some people just want to get involved and they may want different levels of control. I had a recent discussion um, with another agency around personal health budgets and um, I think that one about taking control is an interesting example which I'll just share with you because they were all up for it about people getting involved as long as they ultimately had the control and the say at the end of it which to try and point out that wasn't quite the point. Um, clinicians need to be involved but actually the decision should be with the individual. In terms of the approach that we've taken, um, again, it's not rocket science, and I think, again, it's just about reinforcing this. It is about taking the time and the effort to get a good cross-section of people in the same room. And that might sound fairly obvious, but actually a lot of people tend to do that in separate groups. Actually having the people in the same room together is quite critical. So for us, it was about involving predominantly service users and carers, but equally having providers, uh, care management staff, and health agencies all engaged so that they could all import and feel that they were contributing in an equal way. But actually it was around the journey that I think both uh, Keith and Sam have talked about, the journey for the individual and their experience. We've used that, to, as you can see at the last comment there, to, to, to create a reference group and for our local accounts. Like many local authorities, our first version I thought was very good, very glossy, uh, but very much a public document written for professionals. The second version we had, I thought, was a lot better and used a lot of personal stories, but was still not really co-produced. And the third version, which we've got coming out fairly soon, is actually written by service users, which is where I wanted it to get to. But it's a journey. We're not going to get there in one, in one go. I think for us, uh, as I said, holding workshops and very much owning the I statements, I'll go one slightly better. Um, we've got the I statements as part of uh, the Health and Wellbeing Board strategy, so they're signed up to by all the agencies. They're not necessarily signed up to making it real, so I might try that one. But they're actually getting the I statements as a document that all of the agencies have signed up to, and we're using that now as part of how to measure the impact of the Health and Wellbeing Board. Um, in terms of the projection of how we then make it, make it real, actually tangible, and something we can hold, be held to account on, as I said, we've linked it into our local accounts. And Oliver, who's sitting here in the front um, and has been doing some work for, on behalf of TIASC looking at this, uh, I think a lot of authorities are doing similar. 
But I think it is something that if your authority, whether it's where you live, where you receive services, or where you work, you might want to say to them about how are we linking it strongly into our local account? Can you pull out the I statements? Can you make the link to making it real? Uh, again, we very much looked at how that um, is going to fashion itself for the third version, if you like, that's coming out. And I expect that from a service user's perspective, or from the general public, they can pick it up and see the stories of individuals and what it's meant for them. And as an example in that, um, what you can see here is, is that people have actually told us one of the key things that they want is information, because they find that actually they get swamped with information, so they need it in a more digestible form. What we have got, um, and we put a, a reasonable amount of effort into supporting people to tell their own stories and to help them to, to give the key messages they want to give to others. My experience, and I assume you've got the same experience, is people are very uh, willing to share their experiences and their stories, both good and bad, and generally tend to be on the positive, um, even when things haven't quite worked out, what they've learned through that. What they wanted to do, and they've distilled out of it, and we're putting it online, is a narrative so that other people can hear it from service users, not from professionals. We've also uh, looked at then how we can make it more interactive, and as part of the website that I was talking about, people will be able to use it a bit like um, we would all use TripAdvisor and that sort of thing, so that people could make very direct comments. One of the key things that people have, have struggled with is around personal assistance. So as an example, throughout our document, hopefully, hopefully it is you said, we've done, but they are real issues, and I think that is about how to make it real for people in terms of what advice and support did they want. Again, we're not universally the only people that are doing this, but it is about how do you reflect the messages, that, the key messages that people are giving. One of the things that was touched on by colleagues before me, and I want to stress this very heavily really, is that um, the engagement model and the whole of our planning isn't really just about adult social care, and I say that as a director of adult social care. If you just focus on adult social care, we've kind of lost before we started. I think it is about a borough-wide approach, as far as it's total council, but it is also about all of our partner agencies, and this is the approach that we've adopted in the Health and Wellbeing Board. And I think for me, I don't want to talk about adult social care, I want to talk about wellbeing. People aren't interested in adult social care, they're interested in wellbeing. And I think it's at a community level, an individual level, and at a family level. We do have targeted social groups because they have specific needs, but how are we linking it to the economy, to skills, to asset-based approaches where people can feed back? And I'll come back to that in the last slide. Many of you will have seen this sort of diagram before, but I think it is about recognising that people are at these different levels and how well are we doing it. And marking ourselves on that journey of where we're doing different elements of this. Some examples really of how we're doing it, and I think you all have similar things going on, but if you haven't and you want to speak to us about it, I'm more than happy to share. And yeah, you probably guessed I am trying to gallop through because there are quite a few slides. The engagement one in commissioning I wanted to put up, because we all have these commissioning cycles, and I guess uh, most places you go to, there'll be a commissioning strategy, which will all have pinched the same diagrams from the Department of Health. Uh, ours has got it. Uh, but I think what we're trying to draw here is how fragmented it can be, which is what Keith mentioned. The system in many ways has got more complicated uh, rather than less. And I think you've got to therefore think through that have you got a single engagement strategy, which is across agencies, that's created some interesting challenges for us as a health and wellbeing board, but I think it's worth the effort. Um, in terms of then how we are commissioning and we're engaging with people around that, uh, again, as we said, there are multiple sort of examples and ways in which we do it. But I think the, the couple of slides back, what we've got to be clear is, is that we're doing this not completely through altruism. We know that we'll design better services, with better, that we'll deliver better outcomes. And that's actually how people are going to vote. So there's a good way to get your members engaged. Because I think that what we've seen by engaging people in it, we will get better decisions and better use of resources. The, the final couple of slides I wanted to put up is that I think the other challenge that we've got is almost at the other end of it, is if you've got um, good information and advice to inform people to make, to support people to make informed decisions, you've refined your processes and not allowed your self-assessment to become a 48-page document and people are much more in control of their own assessing and their own arrangements, whether it's personal assistance or whatever, 
The reality at the moment is in most local authorities, and I suspect in, in most of the statutory agencies, that we're still delivering pretty much the same services that we always delivered. So one of the issues we need to put a, a lot more effort into is how do we work with providers who are not the antichrist, they're part of the solution. Uh, we need to work with them to talk about the aspirations that people who are receiving support have and how they would like their needs to be met. And therefore it's co-production, not just with service users, it's also with providers. And it's quite a difficult territory for, for some people. <coughs> Uh, and I think it's one which you need to take back because co-production is about all of the people who've got a part to play. Interestingly, some health and wellbeing boards see themselves purely as commissioning agents rather than as setting strategic direction. And I think they can set strategic direction without key providers having an involvement. I find that quite an interesting uh, idea. Um, and not one which, as you can probably um, ascertain, that I would support. I think that we know some of the challenges that are ahead, and I've put some of them up there. They're the same nationally, uh, I'm not going to read them all out. We know the demand that's coming, and we know that just doing less of the same, for most of us, is just not acceptable. We do need to, to do something differently. And I think personalisation as a model, uh, and some of the examples, whether it's personal budgets is one aspect of it, is one of the things that we need to embrace. The last slide I wanted to put out, because somebody actually just asked me uh, during the coffee break is, but is it sustainable given the issues um, that local government and the statutory sector are facing? My retort would probably be the opposite, that if, if we don't embrace this approach, um, what we're doing now isn't sustainable. I think the issue that uh, we maybe don't highlight enough, and it's really shining examples of people that are here today, is that there is a, an absolute wealth of asset out there of people who use services who are prepared to reciprocate. And actually, if they're asked, the caricature that I use in Barnsley is asking a 19-year-old woman who happened to be a single parent <coughs> with three children who needed support. And um, the first uh, thing that she couldn't get over was that somebody took the time and effort to actually ask her what her view was. The second thing was the leader of the council was always worried that people would uh, be negative about the council uh, when we asked them questions. Uh, there was a slight interesting feedback for him on that because she didn't actually know what the council was, so she wasn't negative about it. Uh, and the third one was, even as a, somebody who was, um, if you like, quite challenged in terms of their life position, when asked if she could contribute something, she was more than willing. What she reflected back was my common experiences. I've never been asked, so I didn't know that I could. So I would want to give you, leave you with a message: is that there is capacity out there. We just need to ask for it.